And uh, now, and uh, to end this uh, two uh, days of conference, we will have this uh, uh, session to speak uh, about uh, ideas put forward by human beings. We have uh, with us four experts for uh, magnificent human beings. Uh, and we've been talking about technology and uh, progress, but uh, we reach uh, conclusions uh, thanks to human beings. So we start with uh, Jose Luis Larrea. Big applause for him. He is an economist and uh, uh, PhD in competitiveness and sustainability. We also have Stephen Daunt with uh, us, uh, who is a, a lecturer in the Levine University. Uh, um, thank you, the Levine University. And uh, we also have Lobsang Thopa. We've already enjoyed his uh, presentation previously, so we don't need to introduce him. And Joao Santos, who is a senior expert on uh, from the Commission in um, Europe. So big round of applause for the four of them. Como decía, un auténtico plantel maravilloso de a great set of experts to put the end to this experience, a human-centered end to this experience. José Luis, we wanted to draw some conclusions from the panels yesterday, and you chaired the first panel. So can you tell us a little bit about what you were spoken, speaking about in your panel? What are the conclusions you drew from yours? Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. It's a bit difficult for me to kick this off because I don't know if we actually are human beings. I think we are, but at least I try to be a human being after having uh, seen you uh, and listened to you. I realized how far we've got as human beings. Maybe from an economist uh, viewpoint or a viewpoint from uh, talking about competitiveness, that's the way I'm drawing conclusions from. So I need to summarize what was said yesterday. And here we're going to mix what I think and what people said, because there were several people in my panel session yesterday. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to really do the panel justice. But anyway, the title of our panel was so broad that we could have actually really spoken about anything. It was about the future, innovation, and technology. That was what our panel was about. So under that title, what we tried to do was to find a sort of a guiding thread of how to link these three ideas and to provide them with meaning. Probably each and every one of us will um, give them different meanings. It was a very positive session. There was Pili, who's the person who, on a day-to-day, -day, has to make sure that everything works in all of the FP or the VET colleges, and everything has to be useful, and it has to be applied. So everything that we do has to happen, and that's thanks to Pili. Then we had Maida in our workshop, who's got a fairly small company, 10 people working in her company. They're working in uh, on drugs and on anti-cancer drugs. So that mm, helped brought us on to how we can link innovation to entrepreneurship. So the, all of everything they said was very suggestive to me. I could spend hours uh, talking about that. And I try not to talk for too long. So the guiding thread of our panel was that the future isn't something that's around the corner, but the future is now. The future is the present. Sometimes we use the word future as an excuse to not do what we have to do now because we think, oh, it's in the future. We'll do it. Somebody else will do it in the future. But actually, the future is now. And the world is undergoing incredible transformation. 
innovation actually is the same as transformation, full of uncertainty, which is kind of logical because there's a lot of complexity and a great deal of diversity. It's a great opportunity to do things. If there was no diversity, there would be no complexity. We'd all be the same. We'd all be clones. All of this would be very, very boring. We wouldn't transform anything. And, and in fact, that's probably what machines are all about. I'm going to ask you to please use the hand mic because it seems that your microphone has a problem with it. Just please... Please, you know how it is. We just need you to use your the hand mic and put it close to your mouth. Anyway, this world that's undergoing transformation, many things are happening. One of the trends is everything that's resulting from digital transformation and technological development. That really impacts us. Our da the danger is that we only concentrate on that and don't concentrate on the fact that other things are happening. For example, there are demographic challenges. There's the issue of sustainability, alternative energy sources, the increasingly globalized and interrelated world, everything related to employment, the social dimension of enterprises, and everything else that we need to consider. We could, of course, be very, very aware of uh, what's going on and remember that how that affects us as people. And I think there's a very uh, mental paradigm uh, shift. I think all the language they use now is very territorial at the moment, very spatially based, very uh, closely linked to what is physical, what is material. And it's not that the world is going to change. It already has changed. It's now more relational. Products, of course, are very important. But equally as important as products are services. Services are related to products. And the hierarchical um, setups were OK back in the day. But now uh, we have to be interconnected. We have to be relational. Otherwise, we can't set things up. The idea of ownership, the fact that to use something that you have to own it is something that's just an idea that's gone out the window now. I don't necessarily need to own a car to be able to move around. I just need to access mobility to move around. I think this is changing the way we see the world and the way we relate to each other. And information technology has, of course, got a key role in all of this. And an example of this spatial paradigm, which tends to create uh, silos, is how for example, the education system is articulated and how it's related to the world of business. It seems that there are ages in which we should be studying and there are other ages in which we should be working. That is no longer true. You either carry on learning all your life or you're going to be lost in this world, in this modern world. But some people sometimes think, OK, first you've got um, secondary education, you've got VET, then you've got university education. But it's not as simple as that. You don't progress linearly. Maybe 30 years ago, when everything progressed linearly and when people had these great human resource plans, maybe that was a useful thing to follow. But actually, this change in speed is so incredible now that that's a pointless way of thinking. That's made me think that, OK, actually, these are new. That's a good news for innovation, because I think innovation emerges from relational spaces and from understanding those relational spaces. And there are three elements that we saw yesterday, which are very, very important when you have to face a world undergoing transformation. One is this very idea of competitiveness, which affects the company. That needs to change. That needs to evolve. We're true experts in territorial competitiveness, in business competitiveness. And yet we've forgotten that actually competitiveness shouldn't be a 
goal in its own right, but something that is used to increase people's welfare. We've only, we seem to have forgotten that competitiveness is only good if it helps the welfare of people. This new way of understanding competitiveness, and I'm not saying that the other ways of understanding competitiveness hasn't helped us, but this new way is key. Competitiveness uh, understood as something that is to serve people. This changes the way we approach the competitiveness debate. Somebody might say to you, oh, you know, competitiveness has always spoken about people, but people as a production factor. It's made people into a production factor. We need to go beyond this debate. This debate is actually closely linked to innovation because actually competitiveness is based initially on natural resources, then cheap labor, and in the end, innovation. And in fact, we start and we begin with innovation because if competitiveness is something that needs to progress, needs to transform as well, so it needs to innovate. The second thing that is related to the first is another key element in the whole of this world is knowledge. But knowledge understood as a result of learning. It's really Knowledge is really important. When I headed up a company, I always used to say, oh, you know, we need to attract knowledge. Yeah, knowledge is really important because it explains why you've got where you've got to. But if knowledge doesn't grow through learning, it won't be useful for the future. So in this, on this scale, on the importance of knowledge, the emphasis that we highlighted yesterday was that knowledge is a result of learning. And the revolution that we're immersed in, even though it's not very uh, glamorous, this word is learning. It's a learning revolution. Sometimes universities, rather than teaching, ought to be learning. There's a sentence that says, okay, when you teach, you actually learn twice. Maybe it's 50 times that you learn. This is another key thing that we all need to carry on learning. Then we spoke about innovation. Yes, because a learning process is a transformation process. It's an innovation process. This is all very fractal. It has to work starting with one person, when that person relates to others, they create organizations. And with those organizations, we need to apply all these uh, criteria. In the case of innovation, what can I tell you? Many debates surrounding innovation. The first problem that we have is how to define and build a common language. What do we understand by the word innovation? If we carried out a survey today and we asked anybody, to, everybody to write down what, what they understand innovation to mean, we'd probably write down very different things. And as I said earlier, innovation is a collective construction. If we want to build something together and share it, then we need to share language. And I think what you're doing in VET networks, this idea of Creating a common language will facilitate everything. So that's a little bit what uh, innovation says to us. Innovation sets challenges for us. And to finish, perhaps I could give a little bit of advice from my experience, which uh, about the factors, the things that should be taken into account for an innovation system to be strong. I'd start with principles and values. Okay, you can debate what principles are and what values are. Let's start with values, shall we? Then there's technology. But for me, technology is actually secondary. It's instrumental. It's a tool to use. For me, technology is a structured type of knowledge which should be used to solve a need. The thing is, we need to know how to use these technologies properly. So values, technology, knowledge, and learning. Leadership cooperation, and something else that's really important in an innovation system, which is the speed with which this all needs to move. You might say, OK, in innovation, they say, oh, it's better late than never. No, actually, it's better never than late sometimes. Mm, so that links innovation to entrepreneurship. For me, they're actually both the same thing. And how 
entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial processes can help strike a balance between modelization and creativity, how important it is whether innovation is always rupture, is there going to be conflict? We need to be able to manage conflict. We shouldn't be frightened by conflict. This importance of coexisting with more questions than answers. Of course, that need to be. Uh, we need to try to respond to those questions, but we might not necessarily have the responses initially. How important it is to go beyond our limits, to go outside our comfort zones, and how important it is to be entrepreneurial. This is a capital part and an expression of innovation. I'll finish with that. I think future is built by getting engaged and getting committed to innovation and transformation based on a culture of lifelong learning and taking into consideration values, principles, knowledge, learning, technology, leadership, innovation, and speed. I don't know if I went on for too long. That's about a summary of our workshop. You were very good at summarizing. You were very structured in your own explanation. That was great. You explained it really, really well, Jose Luis. And you spoke about innovation. You spoke about conflict. Maybe I could ask you the conflicts that emerge as a, as a result of change, because change creates conflict. How do you manage these kind of conflicts along the way? Maybe we should ask the people that are out in the audience, how do you manage conflict? My uh, life in business, when I've uh, had to deal with responsibilities, the word conflict actually is very negatively received. And yet conflict is part of the nature of things when you're changing things. So think and I don't know whether you do this, I think you need to teach people how to manage conflict and how to solve conflict. This is a question that actually came up in yesterday's panel, the level of conflict. And I remember working at Deusto University and the rector started to explain to us what he was changing. And, and I said to him, look, I want to ask you a question. It's not a trick question. Well, and I wanted to ask him, with everything that you do, are, is it leading to a conflict? Because if you are not having conflict, I don't think you're actually doing anything. It seems that if you ask that question and you just say, oh, is there a conflict without adding the extra bit, then you're not really answering a question. My impression from yesterday's panel is that people that work in VET know how to manage conflict. That's why you're progressing so much. That's why you're advancing so much. And I've said this on many occasions. You are an example for the education system. I'd love for universities and secondary education to take a lot more notice of what you're doing. I'm sure you do have conflicts, but if you hear of the sort of faces that I'm seeing out there aren't faces of people that get stuck in conflict and don't solve the conflict, maybe we should ask them. Let, we'll ask them a little later. We'll ask when we carry on the debate later. OK, I've got another question here. How, how do you design entrepreneurial processes in the Basque country? Well, how are they designed in general? Or how? what, what, what inputs are required for entrepreneurial processes in the Basque country? Well, for me, an entrepreneurial process is the same as an innovation process. We could debate that. But I think an entrepreneur, by nature, is the protagonist of an innovation process, i.e., a process in which things need to be changed. How are they designed? Well, you have to have two things. And I think these are present in Technica and the network of VET. It's really important to understand that innovation is a result of creativity, 
but it doesn't stop with creativity. It needs what the se a second point, which I call modelization. The idea is great. It's great to have a spark. We humans have something that makes us different, which is our ability to imagine. That creates uh, creativity and helps us create ideas. Of course, you need to have spaces available to be creative. You, then you need to create spaces so that our imagination ability actually comes to the surface. So physical spaces do affect creativity. But if you just get creativity, I'm really tired of finding people who have great ideas in a company. And then I say to them, well, why don't you write that great idea on a piece of paper? But they never write it on a piece of paper. The piece of paper never reaches a desk. So it's that next step. So that creativity, this ability to imagine, is then translated into a model. Language is a model, for example. So it's to be able to communicate to others your idea, this is really important. So in processes, this is key. It's key to work, creativity and modelization. And it's a little bit loop-like because once you've created a model, then you create a prototype, then you can see whether the idea is great as you thought it was. There are all different kinds of models and not just actually making a physical thing. For example, a general accountancy plan. That's also a model. It's not something that you physically create, but it's how we can explain the situation, the economic situation of a company. That's a model. It's key. It's key, this debate. So in processes, it's really important to be able to articulate these two things. So modelizing is actually uh, converting a, an event into a process happening into a process. So innovation shouldn't just be something that comes down onto you, but it should be something you can anticipate. OK, if you suddenly get a light bulb, if you suddenly have a light bulb moment, that's great, but that doesn't always happen. When do you have that light bulb moment? Normally, if you're working all the time on creativity. So the opportunity needs to coincide with the ability, shall we say. If you don't have the ability, it's really difficult f for this light bulb m moment to happen. We need to create spaces. I think um, something that you're doing really well is creating in organizations these moments. As Winston Churchill said, we do the buildings, and then the buildings actually affect us. And we come from a, a culture in which how many square meters do you have of a, in your office? Well, that's, that illustrates your value. But actually, what we want are open spaces. I think you're working now in open spaces. It's open spaces that facilitate innovation processes. I think that these spaces, and, and I, you're going to get bored of me repeating myself. I think this is for... Innovation processes, learning processes. Well, first, we have we need stimulating spaces. Second, dialogue. Third, reflection. Reflecting yourself, and then action, and then putting into practice. Then dissemination, and recognition. All of these stages. Uh, what's more? work as a spiral, not a circle. Because something that's closed like a circle can't grow. That's why it's a spiral process. I prefer spirals. I don't know if you know that today is... It's Fibonacci's day. Fibonacci... It's the is very well known for his Fibonacci series, because today is the 23rd of the 11th, 2023. This Fibonacci uh, sequence is represented as a spiral, and you find that in nature, you find that in how plants grow, and in snail shells, and innovation actually is life. If we have an advantage, 
And and I'm going to end up with another quote from Gaudi who said that originality requires you to go back to your origins. So let's now go get too tied up because basic things, key things are just key things. But technology actually can help us solve basic questions better for humanity. Okay, I've left. I'll, you leave me with creativity and innovation. Thank you, Jose Luis, for explaining that so well. Let's now move on to our next uh, speaker, Stephen. To rescue some conclusions for yesterday, yesterday's session. Yes. When you uh, want. Uh, does this work? Yeah. Okay. Well, um, we had a very nice session uh, uh, yesterday afternoon, but may maybe I just have to start with an apology because we here are only 20% of humanity. I think uh, we are missing the ladies here, and we're all, four, four of us, well, depending on how you look at it, but quite gray. So. Um, so we don't, do not re represent a total of uh, humanity here, and uh, I, I think the ideas that we want to share should be shared uh, in, in a broader way. Um, so I, I hope, f hopefully, uh, in what I can, can share, that uh, I touched upon uh, the broader uh, aspects uh, which are important. The discussion that we had was on, on the change from Industry 4.0 to indus Industry 5.0 with industry 4.0 being the idea that technology is going to solve everything. But my colleague professor here has uh, clearly explained uh, what the arrogance is with uh, technology and that technology itself does not innovate, does not bring things about. I don't know if you've ever been into a self-service shop like uh, from Amazon but there's no innovation itself coming from the shop. It is only in the direct contact with the customer that you understand that something new can happen. So you need the human. You need uh, somebody there to learn from what the people are experiencing in, in these shops. So um, technology does not innovate itself. It's the humans working with technologies. And then you, uh, the next question, is then what is needed then for these humans to innovate? Well, they need technology. So the discussion is from how do we move from a situation where we only stress technology, Industry 4.0, to, to go to another situation which is Industry 5.0, which puts the, the person, the individual central, but not only, not only as an individual person, but as an individual in broader groups, and which, which I would say it's not only human-centric, but it's also social-centric. You need groups of workers to, to change the situations. You need to share within groups. You need uh, the, the discussion at the, the company level. You need the discussion even with trade unions. Um, to make changes and to see if innovation can be installed. My colleague here has also explained that it's a very complicated process. In economics and in innovation management, they're, they're talking about the value of death, and that's not something horrible, but it's uh, between the fact that you have this idea, which was explained, and the fact that you, at a certain moment, can come to a proof of concept. A lot of ideas just get stuck at the ideas phase. But you not only have this first value of that, you have a second value of that. That's when you have the proof of concept and you want to implement it in the organization. At that, in, that, in this second phase, you need to uh, work with those that are going to implement the technologies and the ideas. You need what we would say workplace innovation as, as a practice, as an idea, to to make these changes happen. So you need to overcome not only one value of that, you need to overcome two values, uh, values of that. And Industry 5.0 wants to create the situation where you can have these changes impl implemented and um, achieved. In our discussion yesterday, there were uh, also some points made on uh, things that we're not aware of when we're talking about Industry 5.0. One of the points is we're thinking too much from the big companies. 
I know here in the Basque country there are also very big companies, very good innovators, but I'm sure here 90, 90%, 95%, 99% of companies are SMEs, very small companies that have very different practices and that need to understand how they can do that. And if you want to make uh, these companies more successful, you cannot do that by just saying to them, well, install an HR function or in install an innovation function. No, small SMEs need to collaborate uh, with each other. They need to have these networks that support them. And one of these important networks is the VET sector. The VET sector, and that was what we also identified in our discussion uh, yesterday, is um, the change factor, the change actor in, in what can happen. So having a really good VET sector is a driving force for innovation in, in a region. And maybe then the last lesson from this discussion yesterday is that here in the Basque country, you, you, you do that quite well. The, um, um, I've, I've been coming to the Basque country, I think now for about 15 years. And when we came here, there was always this, this question, well, from the north, from Finland, Sweden, and, and, and all these very nice cold countries, um, they have this fantastic innovation model, and what can the South learn from that? Well, I'm now, as I said, I've been here for 15 years, and uh, I think you have uh, something that you can export to the north. <laughs> So, um, and l let me just stress some, some, some important point, points. Uh, this networking, uh, I was this week with, uh, uh, with Unai. Where are you, Unai? I'm trying to see, where, where, where are you? Oh, there he is, yes. Um, at, at, at his uh, school, Maltuna, and I don't know what the second part, part is, but uh, uh, a really, really fantastic uh, location to see these students work with all these new technologies. And, but having this networking with all the companies, that's something that in the North we certainly can learn, for, uh, learn about. The second thing I think is, and that's really the, the, the Basque character, that is that you're so proud proud of what you do and proud of what you achieve. And this proudness is something that we uh, also can learn, learn about from you. The other point, and that's also connected to this networking, is this connection to policymakers. They are here on the, on the front seat. The, 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 the fact that you can do that, that you can bring them here into this uh, event, is something amazing. And that is something that we should, should have uh, 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 have in North because they're they just leave the schools to, to themselves. So that's something that we certainly can can uh, can 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 learn learn about. And uh, there are so many more things uh, with Unai and, and with uh, Alexia. So we're working with one of these interventions that that has been uh, developed here. It's called the Learning Factory, trying to start from um, technologies that are not used in the companies. So Industry 4.0 just delivers uh, technology, but they're not p picked up and they're not uh, taken up. Well, in having the learning factory as an experimental in environment in which students, together with companies, are exp experimenting with these technologies and trying to learn what they, they can use within the company settings and selecting from these technologies, uh, that, that is important. So in our discussion yesterday from Industry 4.0 to Industry 5.0, we created this context, trying to learn from the, the Basque country, and I hope uh, that that, uh, that that is something that we will be able to share, because we're working together with Unai and with others from uh, the Basque country in this Bridges 5.0 project, trying to create this bridge from Industry 4.0 to Industry 5.0, and hopefully uh, implement the Basque model as the new European model for learning and training. Thank you very much, Stephen. Un fuerte aplauso para él. Big round of applause for Stephen. So to summarize your uh, words, you talked about uh, uh, yesterday's uh, session, the challenges of innovation and regulating uh, Industry 5.0. And you also had very kind uh, words for the role of the VT in the Basque Country. And you even talked about exporting some of the uh, best known values of uh, Basque VT to the rest of Europe. So regarding this, Stephen, what are the values or aspects that you believe could be uh, also exported to Europe? 
from the BET in yes, the Basque Country. Um, thank you, thank you for the, the question. Uh, the, um, well, let, let me just start with this concept of Industry 5.0 because I'm not sure that everyone is, is aware of what this new uh, policy idea is at the European level. Um, um, just to give you some information, there is a community of practice industry 5.0, which has uh, been launched uh, two weeks ago and which is going to run up to, to May. Um, and it's built on this idea of industry 5.0. As, as I've explained, industry 4.0 is about technology, it's about profits. Industry 5.0 is about putting the human central but from this socio-centric perspective, so including not only the individual and bringing the technologies around this individual, it's about the individual with his colleagues, with his uh, uh, stakeholders in, his, in, in the environment using the technologies that, 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 that can be better used and, and better applied. The second idea is about sustainability. We have left companies to do whatever they wanted. Um, and now we're paying the price. Uh, so we need a different situation in, in which companies take the lead to become net zero or net negative. The last thing that would be really helpful because we are, we're, we're, I don't know if anyone is, is planning on skiing, uh, going skiing this, uh, this, this, this winter. I hope there is. <laughs> But uh, we need a, a more sustainable uh, policy from, from companies. They need to manage their externalities uh, in a better way. And the last element is resilience, which is in the industry 5.0 a quite complicated concept, but sim simplified, it's about supply, the supply chains to manage them better, to make sure that we have the, the, uh, the resources that we need for the future, that we don't waste them in, 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 in a lot of practices. But these kinds of ideas are already practiced here by a lot of big companies, uh, uh, and probably also by SMEs, but I don't have uh, all the information there. Um, but like Mondragon, uh, 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 the, the, these companies are put as example uh, uh, of Industry 5.0 at, at the European level. They were mentioned in, in the kickoff meeting um, uh, two weeks ago. So uh, tomorrow I'm going to visit Mondragon, so I'm quite happy that, 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 that I have this, uh, the, uh, the possibility to have this experience. But these kinds of ideas, they should be exported. They should be uh, 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 put uh, as, as the leading examples for what we need to do in the future at company level, at the societal level. Yeah. Pues resumía básicamente hablando eh, de los valores, eh, la sostenibilidad, la resiliencia. You were talking about sustainability, resilience, and the values of VET in the Basque Country. Now we will continue with our third uh, speaker, Lob Sang. You have the floor. I would ask you to please uh, summarize uh, yesterday's um, uh, panel and the conclusions of this panel. I have to ask you to please understand me because everything I'm seeing here during these days is incredible. It is as if I suddenly talked about uh, subtle minds to you and you would ask yourselves, what is this? Well, everything here is new for me. It's a new world for me after being uh, uh, away from the world for 17 years. I haven't been fully disconnected, but I've been really disconnected, so this is overwhelming for me. I don't uh, really know how to explain what they've explained because they are the professionals, and I think Antonio Maria should be here instead of me. <coughs> yes, of course, many people could be part of this uh, uh, discussion, but I'm sure people will uh, uh, thank your vision. In fact, uh, it is a complementary vision of uh, someone that has done something fully different. For me, the way in which the world is uh, progressing, what's most important in all this progress is uh, for this progress uh, to uh, be useful uh, in the welfare and happiness of uh, humankind. If all of this uh, progress and development at these uh, levels is not used uh, for, it's not uh, making people uh, happier, uh, starvation disappear, families be protected, and 
human beings being able to develop themselves as human beings, then it, it is uh, useful. Through each of the speakers, and it's been very pleasant for me to listen that you never forget the human side of things, the individual ethics, but also the social ethics and environmental ethics. Because taking care of ourselves means that we taking are taking care of society because we are social beings and there is an interdependence relationship, something we should never forget. There's always an unavoidable um, relationship between ourselves, what we believe we are, and what we really are. There's this interdependence law between us and others and society. We are never separated, never alone. And there's this interdependence between us and the physical world in which we live. Let's never forget this. If through all this intelligence that we have as human beings, uh, we've been able to develop these incredible things, then all of this has to be at the service of humans. And not that it controls human beings, as uh, some others have uh, very beautifully said. So the values of human beings can never be lost. They should uh, be the umbrella uh, under which everything else is developed. And uh, we need to progress and implement this uh, progress in schools, in VT uh, colleges too, because if we develop this intrinsic uh, uh, qualities uh, beyond other uh, qualities in our minds, the development, for example, of attention that I mentioned in uh, my panel, uh, well, we will be able to be more in contact with ourselves and with the world. We will uh, be able to focus more, to be more aware, to be aware of what is happening at this exact moment in time and how what you do affects the world and how the world is also having an effect on you. Therefore, and having faith in uh, human beings, because I've always had this faith, because human uh, uh, beings are uh, good by nature. We just make mistakes, mistakes because of fundamental ignorance that we have uh, to uh, overcome. So we have uh, wonderful people with privileged and healthy minds and we should all have access to this kind of uh, minds, minds that are working for the well-being of others, using their capacity of transforming physical matter and even being able to control and uh, have this uh, wonderful uh, know-how of matter to put it at the service of others to uh, contribute to their well-being and not uh, to for to contribute to them being in a worse uh, situation and all this uh, is something that comes from our minds and our minds need to be healthy minds minds that are able to understand themselves, what they are doing, and to understand that what we do uh, has an effect on others, and to understand what surrounds us. In the same way in which we've seen how through last the last year's scientists, those that have a broader view and that observe the world in which we live and say to us, we are reaching limits. We've polluted the physical world because of specific conditions. <coughs> They've warned us of what the dangers are and how this can affect the physical world. Well, in exactly the same way, we can work with the human mind. Our mind can be polluted if we don't take care of it. It can be polluted 
and at a point in time, the mind won't be able to understand itself nor what it's happening outside. So what's fundamental is to take care of the health of our minds. We talk about the health of our bodies, but we forget uh, to take care of our minds, understanding our mind and understanding that it has an incredible potential to do that many things. A mind can understand it can do many things that we can do good and also evil. So that's why it's so important. And I've heard this uh, from different panelists, and that's uh, that the people that in the future will manage all of these technologies have to be uh, trained adequately, and they have to be uh, prepared uh, and uh, trained in the principles of what being a human being is, understanding that they have the potential of taking one path or the other. Uh, let me ask you about this interior uh, science that you were mentioning and interior growth. From that uh, standpoint, is progress uh, real? Do we really progress when we uh, uh, focus on the outside? Of course. Of course it's real. We live in a reality in the human uh, uh, realm. But is there an evolution? Yes, of course, there has been an evolution. It uh, uh, would be absurd to say that there hasn't been an evolution. As human beings, when we think about how everything outside uh, can be um, managed uh, physically, that uh, generates uh, happiness and well-being. But what we also need to reflect on is that however we manage the outside world uh, matter and we're able to transfer this matter for the uh, well-being of human beings, that is not enough for what uh, we need as human beings because it's well-being and happiness. Never forget this. So it's not enough real happiness. Uh, the well-being that we are searching for is inside us, even though everything outside can help us. Uh, but as we can see, it can decrease uh, suffering. but technological progress, uh, t- progress in uh, construction, in everything, has helped us uh, lift uh, with more dignity. But we've also seen that it's not so, that it's not enough, that it's not enough to make us happy. Yes, maybe I didn't explain myself adequately, but yes, to be happy, we need to Uh, focus on that progress, but also uh, have that conscience guiding that progress. Yes, yes, if we focus on that conscience, then things will progress. And science and human intelligence use its uh, capacity, its cognitive capacity to understand what surrounds us, and we've been able to transform it for the benefit of others. And we need to do exactly the same thing with your mind. Your mind has two positions, looking inwards and outwards. It has been looking outwards for many years. So look at what where we are now. So let's not forget the other position. The other capacity of our conscience and awareness is to understand itself and what it's doing and our responsibility when we uh, implement things in the world, especially when they affect others. Thank you. Thank you for your words. They've been very valuable. So big round of applause to Lobsang uh, Sopa. Thank you for uh, providing your perspective. And now I will ask uh, Joao Santos to sum up uh, yesterday's uh, panel. By clarifying that I'm no longer representing the European Commission, unlike what you said, I've I've retired from the Commission uh, uh, nine months ago. I now live in a small place in Portugal. But you are a senior expert, yeah? I was, yes, I was. 
<laughs> but, but because of that, I'd just like to thank once again Jorge Arvalo, Ricard, and Inigo, that although I'm just a retired official living in Portugal, that you still invited me to this uh, event. It's always a pleasure for me, and I think that you know what we've heard over these two days is symbolic of what the vocational system in the, um, in the Basque country is. If you, if you notice, we are here because we all are more or less related to vocational training. However, if you see most of the discussions, they're really not about vocational training itself. And this shows the holistic view that the Basques have about education and training. Because, you know, we brought, we've seen uh, yesterday and today, people coming from science perspective of what, you know, what we should be providing, what we should be doing. We've got people coming from philosophy of the essence of what education is about, what is the purpose of what we are doing. And we've had the pleasure of also listening to a, sp a spiritual uh, perspective on education and training, telling us that, you know, at the end of the day, it's not about just the growth and economic development, it's about the human being. It's about how well we can, as a society, as an education system, provide people with well-being, with happiness. And if we cannot achieve that, then all the rest doesn't count. So I really, you know, thank uh, once again the, the Basque authorities for this and bringing all these different perspectives which then, you know, helps us understand better what we should be doing with vocational training. Now, going back to the panel, because that's what you invited me to talk about, I think we had a very interesting panel, uh, you know, having people from international organizations, innovation organizations, we had vet providers, associations of vet providers, and this allowed us to have our event, our panel, uh, with two parts. The first part in which we try to be crazy, because the theme of this uh, summit is the unimaginable. So we had the first phase of trying, you know, to, to think about the unimaginable. And in that sense, so we had this first phase, and then we had a second phase where we tried to be more realistic and see, okay, now knowing this, what can we expect in the future and what can we do about vocational system to prepare for this future? But just to give you a quick overview of what we did in this crazy creative phase, we thought of three scenarios, how education and training can be in 2050. The first one was imagining that it will be possible, I don't know if it will, but it can be possible, that in 2050 we'll have kind of brain-computer interfaces in which, you know, just like today you go to Netflix and you choose the film you want to see this evening, you can go into some kind of, of uh, similar platform, you say, I want to learn the uh, Basque language, or I want to learn something about, uh, uh, you know, quantum computing. And you can just, with this brain interface, put some helmet on or whatever, and it just discharges whatever skills or competences or knowledge you need to learn that. This might seem crazy, but it, maybe it's not as crazy as, because there's already a lot of experiments. You saw Jorge Arrivalo yesterday speaking, and I think the people that will go to Technica this afternoon might see it, that, you know, they're already controlling these uh, um, uh, drones just through the mind. You know, they're putting the shutters of the house down through the mind and through uh, the eyes. So all of these things that might seem crazy of uh, computer uh, brain um, interfaces in the future might be a possibility. And what does this mean for the education system? If you can just learn competences by uh, integrating this uh, in your head, uh, why do you still need a school? And what are the ethical implications of this? Imagine that someone sells you a package of uh, learning that they say is to learn the Basque language, but in fact there's a small virus there that will make you a horrible person and, you know, not care about uh, your neighbor and so on. So imagine all the ethical implications this has. So this was the first crazy scenario. But we had another crazy scenario, which was genetic engineering. We heard about genetic engineering this morning. So imagine, for example, you know, I would always, uh, it was one of my dreams when I was small, to be a musician. I'm horrible, you know, I've, I've bought guitars, I've bought a lot of instruments. It's not because I buy instruments that I become a good musician. I simply have no skills for that. I don't, I cannot manage, you know, understanding the different levels of the sound, so I'm not good in it. But I would like to have it. So imagine that with, through genetic engineering, those skills that most people uh, have it when they are familiar with, uh, with music, I could, I could have it. There would be some genetic engineering. You saw with CRISP technology, there was a, a presentation this morning,
morning, it is possible to go and change certain genes, the color of your eyes, many things that will be possible. So imagine that in the future, you can use genetic engineering to make your memory much more capable than it is, to make you much more resilient, to make you learn things easier than it is possible for you to do now. So this is a scenario that might also look crazy, but maybe it's not that crazy in 2050. We don't know where we're getting. But, and then the third scenario. The third scenario was imagining that in the future you can learn through virtual reality academies. And what is this? Virtual reality academy, you know that virtual reality already exists. You put these goggles and you sort of imagine you in a different context. So imagine you want to learn about the Roman Empire and you have a virtual academy, a virtual reality academy in which you put this and you are really in the Colosseum in, in Rome many, many centuries ago and you're seeing you know, things happening there. You learn through immersive uh, uh, presence in certain environments. Once again, a crazy scenario, but maybe it will be possible. And in fact, the curious thing is that in our panel, we had people uh, mainly, of course, from vocational training, and I had questions to them. Do you think this will be possible or not? And it's impressive that almost nobody said that this, is, this will not happen. There were people saying this will happen certainly, this, people saying that it is probable that it will happen, but I'm not sure. But it really shows that people in VET are attentive to what is happening and don't have a closed mind except that the world can go in different directions. Of course, I'm not going to get into the details, but we also discuss the ethical implications. So do we really want to manipulate genetic, you know, our DNA in order to learn something? Is this a purpose in life? Do we really want this? But I'm not going to get into this. Now, we had this first phase, creative phase, and then we had the second phase, getting back to reality, and what we discussed I don't have the time to get into the details, but what we discuss is that the smart technologies will have impact at three levels. The first one is on the VET institutions itself, in the way we use smart technologies to improve the teaching and learning process. So, but whatever is done, it has to be done with a context of what is the purpose of why are we integrating smart technologies. And in smart technology, I'm talking about everything from artificial intelligence to simulators to virtual reality, augmented reality. So why we shouldn't adopt, the VET Institute shouldn't adopt new technologies for the sake of adopting them. They should adopt it because it makes, it helps them in their purpose of what they think they should be delivering as institutions. Delivering for the learner, delivering for the teachers, delivering for society. So this is an important element. And of course, we can never forget the teachers. And in, in my panel, we spoke quite a few times about the teachers and trainers, that they are the source of everything we do in the sense that if we don't equip these people with the right skills, with opportunities for personal development, we cannot expect much of the results of what we are doing. So the import, uh, very important element is to maintain these people at the core of the transformations in the vet centers. The second element that I was mentioning is for the learners. So smart technologies, what does this mean for the learner? It means, first of all, teaching them to use the smart technologies in order to learn for the learning process, but also equip them with the skills that they will need when they go to the labor market that is also being transformed with smart technologies. And the third element is what is the impact of smart technologies on the economy and society. So companies are adopting smart technologies, whether we in the VET system are equipping the learners or not, they are adopting them, they are changing their work processes. Society is changing because of smart technologies, because of possibility of remote working. You know, someone can be working in, a, and there's a, there's a case, there's a colleague here from um, a catapult in the Netherlands, and she's based in Spain. And just to tell you that, Smart technologies change also society. The way we learn, we can learn from anywhere. I can be in holidays in the Maldives and I decide to learn something. And it is possible to do it with, uh, uh, with uh, any kind of platform that already exists out there. So we, the VET system has to be attentive also to how society is moving. Not only companies, but how society itself. So not only the economy, but how people are interacting. How are we working? Are we working as we used to do 50 years ago? And the VET system has to be attentive to this in 
in order to adapt what we are doing in terms of uh, uh, qualifications and the content of the curricula so that people are empowered to be part of the society that is being created. And of course, I'd just like to mention that it is important that we don't only think of the individual as an economic tool, but that in schools and in vocational training, we're also forming individuals to be citizens. And you know, education, I, I say this quite often, is not neutral. What you do in education has to do with the society we'd like to build. Because if we want to build a selfish society in which we just care about the very good, the very best, those that are more capable, then we'll have education organized in that way. If we want a society that is cohesive, that cares about each other, then we have to make sure that we have an education system that goes to all, that is equitable, that gives access to all, that takes care of those that have more difficulty in learning, as well as those that have an easier way of learning. So education is not neutral. It has to do with the way we conceive the role that we think that education should have in order to build a fairer and better society, if that's what we want. We might want to just be innovative and you know grow and don't care about uh, equity, and this has important implications. So I could go on for hours, but I think yet you will stop me in a few minutes, so that's what I like to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> Round of applause for you. Well, Joao has summarized his panel yesterday. I'm going to try to summarize what he said, he actually thanked the fact that his panel was interdisciplinary, which is perhaps the key word for today. And the he spoke about the fact that he was so thankful that all these areas could be combined. He also spoke about possible scenarios that sound a little bit like science fiction, the fact that knowledge is just something so simple as putting a device on your head and you can just access the skills that you need. He spoke about the possibilities opened by genetical engineering and virtual academies. He also spoke about the need for there to be an interaction between people who are learning and society and how these two are inextricably linked. And at the end of the day, what we need to form are train our citizens. Joao spoke a little bit about the role of ethics in all of this. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about ethics, Joao. Can you just give me a few comments about maybe the role or the pillars of ethics if we're not going to lose ourselves when we progress towards the future. Which we should look at equity in uh, when we're talking about vocational education and training. One has to do with the uh, vocational system itself. Uh, and here I mean, you know, things like uh, uh, equity and inclusion. Do we want to make sure that the smart technologies that we are using reach everyone? And we know that smart technologies cost money. And we saw that during the COVID period that, for example, uh, children of disadvantaged uh, families had more difficulty because maybe they didn't have internet access, maybe they didn't have the right computers to do it. So technology can introduce uh, discrimination in society because of this. And so we should be careful about this uh, element of equity and inclusion in the sense that reaching out to all, making sure that whatever smart technologies are introduced really can empower everyone to use it in the same way. Of course, then people learn in different rhythms, but in any case, ensure that technology is not going to increase the inequality that we have in society. I think that's a concern that we have to have. Another important element about uh, uh, um, ethics is the bias of algorithms. We know that there's, there's a lot of examples of how algorithms can be biased can be biased if we're talking about, for example, recruitment. If a company has to do a recruitment of some new staff, uh, the, the, the algorithms that are behind the analysis of thousands of curricula can have a bias against certain groups. For example, we know that the typical 
uh, uh, business people that companies are looking for is a white male educated from university and to what extent the algorithms that we are creating uh, reinforce that bias or try to you know minimize that bias and uh, eliminate it completely so that we don't discriminate depending on the color of your skin your sexual orientation or whatever so this is important element that we also have to have the 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 last two uh, elements of uh, of uh, ethics that I'd like to mention which has implications for vet and um, the s smart technologies is on privacy how do we ensure that the interaction that people have through smart technologies assures them privacy because if you want people to embrace it they have to be sure that you know whatever they do and say will not be used against them you know how can we ensure that whatever uh, the students did through smart technologies were in school is not going to be used by an employer when an employer is looking at your CV if they're going to recruit you or not. They're going to say, yeah, but you were, you know, you didn't do this or that, or you were very weak in this. So we've got to make sure that we ensure that the, uh, the smart technology will not uh, violate uh, privacy. The last element is transparency and decision making. So if vo vocational schools introduce smart technologies, be it artificial intelligence, uh, uh, virtual reality, or whatever, we have to have a pedagogical uh, uh, role within the school towards the teachers, towards the system, so that the teachers know what was, what is the purpose of introducing the smart technologies? To what extent can I be sure that this is to improve the teaching and learning process and not to control what I'm doing? So, you know, these uh, elements are important. And if you look at what happened during the COVID, you remember the vaccinations, all these speculation and uh, conspiracy theories around it because people didn't trust. Were they manipulating the, the vaccines in order to change my DNA to make me you know do this or that or have sicknesses in the and this was to a certain extent to a lack of privacy or access to information because when you don't have information and people don't know what is behind it when they don't know what is the decision-making process how were these things done and I think if you trace a parallel to the COVID period and all the conspiracy theories around the vaccines to the education system and smart technologies, we can say the same thing. If a school introduces artificial intelligence, if you introduce monitors, and it's already possible to see how attentive a, a student is in class. Is he uh, awake? Is he dozing off to do something? It's already possible through uh, artificial intelligence and these cams to understand what is happening. And do we want this? Uh, do we want this to happen? Do we want the teacher to go home and say, yes, I saw, I didn't see in class, but now I see in the, uh, through artificial intelligence this student wasn't attentive, so I'm going to punish him in the marks I'm giving. So, I mean, I'm just uh, speculating some, with some examples, but it's these kind of ethical questions that we've got to ask when we are talking about the, the vocational system. And of course, then, it is also our obligation in the vocational system to make sure that the learners have the skills to debate these things themselves, because when they go into a company afterwards, when they are developing code or algorithm for something, they have to think about the ethical implications of what they are doing in the workplace. So it's not only a matter of us in the vocational education and training institutions to think about these ethical considerations. Also, how are we forming these students? How are they going to be as human beings when they get into the, the labor market? How are they going to use the, the ethical reflection and value process in order to do what they are doing in the company? And I gave, and I'll finish with this, I gave an example yesterday that, you know, uh, we're talking a lot about driverless cars. And in the future, there will be cars that take you from one place to the other. But this, of course, it's because there's algorithms there, software algorithms, that tell the car what to do. But then. Imagine you are confronted with a situation that the car is driving itself, and then at a certain point, there's an old lady passing in the middle of the street, and there's on the other side of the street, uh, another lady passing with a baby in a, in a carriage car. The, the, the driverless car has to make a decision. What is he going to do? He will not stop in time, and he's got two dramatic situations there. What is the algorithm that is going to make it, the car decide 
in what direction to go, because something will have to happen. So these are, I'm not saying that there's a right answer to this question, because in fact there is no right answer to it, but it's just to reflect that we have to teach our students that they will be confronted in their working lives with questions like these, and they have to reflect on it. It's not, it's not a mechanical process, just go and because your purpose as a driverless car is to get your passenger as quickly as possible from point A to point B. There's a lot of things that can happen. There's decisions that have to be taken. It will be people programming these things, and they have to reflect on it. It's not an it's not a innocent process. Muchísimas gracias. Un aplauso. Thank you so much, Joao. That was a very interesting explanation of everything that was happening. I'm going to summarize it. Joao spoke about the ethical issues that I'd asked him about. He spoke about fairness, about the fact that AI shouldn't create an even greater divide between those who cannot access it and those who can. He also spoke about bias of AI and uh, the bias of algorithm. Uh, people have sometimes call it uh, artificial stupidity, not artificial intelligence. He spoke about privacy, the possibility of uh, retaining privacy so that AI don't uh, reduce privacy, and the fact that there needs to be a purpose behind everything that we do. And it's here that we've heard everything explained. For those that couldn't actually attend yesterday, I think we've managed to have some summary of uh, what happened yesterday. So I'm now going to hand the floor over to you. I've got this microphone here. This microphone is uh, for you. You can ask or comment on anything else, anything that you feel is appropriate. So let's open for a Q&A. Let's um, hear you loud and clear. This yeah, yeah it's thing? perfect. Yeah. Okay. So I'm very happy to be here. And I want to thank João and the Basque Country for the invitation. And I'm happy because we are talking about future technology, but we really talked most about people. And I think that's the, the real key question in in the future and in everything that we have to think about from now on. If you let me translate it. Básicamente lo que ha dicho es que eh, está muy agradecida de estar aquí porque hablamos del futuro, pero sobre todo de las personas, que son el centro de todo este debate. Yo creo que ha, ha quedado bien claro en todas las ponencias que todo esto no tiene sentido si en, en el medio no están las personas. The speaker is just translating it into English, what's just been said in English. Question um, improving. Um, uh, I would like to to think if all the four people that were talking, they have a, a sentence uh, or a line, a common line for to tell us about the future. Like one-liners. Yeah. One line. Pues hay ese reto que nos lanza. What's your name? What's your name? Sorry. Fernanda, Fernanda nos, nos lanza este reto. A ver si pudiéramos cada uno lanzar una frase. Maybe one, each and every one of you can make a final statement. José Luis. I'm going to give you the microphone. No, can you, I'll repeat what I said earlier. I think future is now. And we can win if we engage with transformation, innovation, and if we have lifelong learning, considering that key, the key elements to that are values and principles, knowledge and learning, leadership, cooperation, technology, and the speed with which we're able to face processes. A long sentence, but we'll allow you to say that sentence because it was very well done. I already had it ready. 
el resto no lo voy a traducir todo seguido, pero básicamente ha vuelto a repetir lo que ya nos había dejado muy claro. Eso es just uh, repeated what had already made clear earlier. That in Spanish one sentence means a lot of sun. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and my, my sentence is uh, red button, so it means uh, the feature is the direction that we want. We want to have on all the technologies a big red button that we can push and stop it and give the direction that we say that's important for us. El futuro es la dirección que nosotros queramos, decía Stephen, fuerte el aplauso para él. Lobsan, si nos puedes dejar una frase a modo de... Lobsan, can you just give us a uh, memorable sentence? Develop human abilities to think, act, relate to each other and feel a purpose in life. That's where we're all come together. If we apply all of this to technology, then I think we'll be taking the right path. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Y por último, Joao. Thank you. And finally, Joao. One of the things that have already been said, I would just like to say that, you know, we are living in uncertain times, in challenging times. But I think that, you know, what inspires the European spirit and the Erasmus spirit, and I think you all know about Erasmus, this idea of collaboration, about talking together. The, when you have complex situations, you need many minds coming together. You need different perspectives, and this will be the best way of confronting the challenges. You see, even in this room, you've got people from everywhere, from Namibia, from Portugal, Spain, everywhere. And it's this capacity that we have, which is basically the Erasmus spirit and the European spirit of getting together, discussing issues, discussing challenges. I think with this constructive approach, we will overcome any challenge that we have in the future. Pues, <laughs> ha sido un poco una frase un poco más larga que la tuya, es verdad, José Luis. Yes, that was a little longer, indeed, a little longer than José Luis. We're not going to compete here, but anyway, it was clear. We need to showcase the different opinions and different places where we come from. And as everybody said, everything is compatible.